I have to toggle back and forth, I can see. All right, Matt, you're live. Okay. Uh, sorry, everyone, for the technical difficulties. Uh, just like uh, SLS, this is late and behind schedule, so it is true uh, to characteristics, but um, wanted to give you a bit of an overview of uh, the Artemis or SLS propulsion systems from a model rocketeer standpoint and talk a bit about how we get back to the moon. So we've got some overview stuff uh, that kind of goes through and, and talks about it. So the NASA Space Launch System is a heavy launch vehicle. Um, they've since then named it uh, Artemis, and the going to the moon stuff is now under Artemis. But originally, SLS really stood for Senate Launch System because it had strong supporters uh, in the Senate, particularly Senator Richard Shelby from Alabama and Senator K. Bailey Hutchinson from uh, Texas, um, who were convinced and knew that NASA needed to have a rocket beyond the shuttle. So that's been the basis for where SLS uh, support has come from in Congress as a NASA-owned, NASA-developed rocket. Uh, and keep in mind, when this originally started, uh, Falcon 1s weren't flying very well, and there was no such thing as real commercial space. So um, they basically uh, you know, used a good portion of the components that were on shuttle, sort of reimagined and uh, and uh, exploited a lot of that uh, technology in order to to build SLS. So it's a huge vehicle. I'll show you how huge it is compared to uh, anything else that's out there for the most part right now. And so Artemis One is going to use the the Block One configuration. That's taller than the Statue of Liberty, and uh, it's a uh, has more thrust than a Saturn V. So. Um, it, uh, it's going to be an impressive thing uh, to see. And as I've told all my friends, I'm going down to see the launch of it because you don't know when you might ever get to see something like this ever go again. And uh, with the two solid rocket motors and the four uh, core RS-25s, it should just absolutely be spectacular. It probably will be nothing louder or more, more uh, visually bright than, than seeing this thing fly. So uh, the first flight will take an Orion spacecraft and have it orbit the moon and then uh, bring, bring it back and they'll, they'll test everything out autonomously and then they will put astronauts on and send Artemis II mission to the moon. They're talking about, you know, the goal was 2024. It probably is gonna be closer to 2026, but they're still, um, like I say, on target to go do that. So this kind of gives you an overview of some of the, the pieces, parts that are on it. Um, the two largest propulsion companies in, in the U.S., Aerojet, Rocketdyne, or Northrop Grumman, make basically all the propulsion hardware. And I'll talk a little bit in, in, in detail, but starting from the bottom, RS-25s are in the core. There's two solid rocket boosters that give it initial thrust off the pad. There's either one or four RL-10 engines that provide the second stage, an adapter. There's a service uh, module with a propulsion mode that actually comes from Europe as part of a, a cost share deal. And then there's a, a, board, uh, a launch abort uh, crew system that provide the propulsion to it overall. So, um, so this kind of gives you an idea of the configuration and where things are going to go, and I'll talk about the top line up here first. So the Block 1 crew has a launch abort system on Orion, and the second stage is what they call an interim cryogenic propulsion stage. And that's the, so that's the first one or two that are going to fly. Eventually, they're going to move into what they call the enhanced upper stage or exploration upper stage, and that'll actually have four RS-25s on it to give it additional additional boost. Um, then the other thing is, is I mentioned that this was a lot of shuttle hardware. So for the first, uh, for the RS-25s, those are old shuttle motors that have been refurbished for single flight use and upgraded. There were 16 remaining from the shuttle program. That's actually not true. There were 14, um, and then they they started to build new. 
So, but after the fourth flight, the vehicle will use all new RS 25s. So that's the that's the uh, the the first uh, wrinkle in it. Then the second thing is is the five segment RSRMs have eight flight sets of steel cases. Um, you later, and then what they call the bowl, which in typical NASA acronyms, that's actually booster obsolescence and life extension. Um, that'll be the that'll be the block two upgrade when it goes to the um, to the uh, the the uh, bowl uh, motors. I've got a little detail coming in on that, and uh, the in in the exploration upper stage. So. So this thing is actually still going to kind of change as they use use out old hardware and start building new. It's also a cargo variation for that that starts with a Delta IV uh, heavy fairing and then eventually moves up to an even, even bigger fairing. And that one especially needs the exploration upper stage. And uh, that one also will be planned for the new RS-25s. Uh, and so that will give a, a fairly large cargo uh, component. And then uh, when they actually add the uh, the bull SRMs, um, it'll give them some additional uh, cargo capacity as well. So um, so this is the long term plan, um, and this is kind of uh, interesting in the standpoint of is there's a lot of committed hardware already out there for it. So when people are talking about you know they've been slow to get to fly, there's there's no doubt about it. It's been a painful time-consuming and frankly meticulous um, effort going in to make sure that this thing works okay but there's a lot of hardware out there for example uh, the first three or four flights of all the solid rocket uh, motors are manufactured the first four flights of the rs-25s are manufactured the tank is uh, taken taken some time uh, but even the Orion capsule is pretty much done so Original thought was his first flight would be at the end of this year. I just saw yesterday they're going to go back and make a second green run. Um, so it's a good good chance that this will probably push the first launch of this to probably this time or spring break in Florida time next year. Oh, what a terrible time to have to go to Florida to see a launch. Um, this kind of talks about the RS-25 engines now in Full disclosure, um, I work at Aerojet Rocketdyne now. I used to work at the places that make up Northrop Grumman Propulsion now, so I've seen and touched most of this stuff one way or a, one way or another. Uh, the RS-25s are basically repurposed uh, single-use, um, what used to be the shuttle SSME um, engines. They're, they're incredibly powerful engines because they burn liquid hydrogen. Uh, and locks, unlike uh, most everything else that's out there that either burns uh, uh, kerosene, which is very powerful and very dense, but not nearly as much energy as liquid hydrogen, or some of the up and coming ones, both uh, the uh, Blue Origin and uh, the uh, spaceship from SpaceX are planned to use uh, methane. And uh, that's, uh, but that's in between in terms of energy for what the liquid hydrogen can deliver. And uh, uh, like I say, they they have a, a, a large number of existing motors, and so you know each motor is serialized, and they keep track of which ones are going to be used on on uh, on the missions. And um, you know the missions, you know th these these things are not necessarily what you would call youngsters. Some of them probably are older than your kids, or maybe your grandkids in some cases, uh, because the first flight of the E-2045 was in January 1998, okay, which flew on STS-89 and, um, you know, also flew on John Glenn. So so at least the first uh, four flights out the gate, you know, have an incredible amount of flight heritage on them and therefore a high degree of confidence that they will uh, they will be uh, be successful. But you can see that, you know, of all these motors, the, the uh, E-2060, only only has three flights on it. Um, probably though, the most interesting thing about that is, is Airjet developed a brand new engine controller that basically updated the old shuttle avionics and put modern modern avionics and modern software into it. And so it's a significant upgrade 
based on uh, not only use in advanced electronics that are smaller, lighter, and have you know considerably more uh, calculating power as well as memory. But also, uh, probably the interesting thing about um, using all the shuttle technology is there's a tremendous database of how these uh, engines performed and the ability to go in and take all that information and take advantage of that when you're writing the new software is uh, is significant. And uh, you know the environments for this are a little bit different. You cluster four of these things together. There's clearly more uh, more acoustic and more heat energy uh, than there was in the three engine shuttle package. So a lot of stuff had to be reanalyzed and looked at in terms of of, uh, of the higher loads and the and the in uh, the, the different environments. But um, as again, these were pretty robust um, engines and. Uh, and so they they're you know pretty well and will I probably be flying these at a little bit higher thrust and that'll give us a little bit better performance when we fly it on SLS. So um, interesting. I, I will tell you, um, um, it's pretty neat to walk in the factory and and see these things sitting sitting right there and see new ones starting to be made as as well. Um, these are the uh, uh, these are not pressure fed like some of the less expensive. These are turbo pump driven with uh, hydrogen and uh, and oxygen. And so uh, so it's a it's a pretty fantastic uh, uh, piece of engineering equipment. You can see them loading. That's one of them being loaded into the test stand um, at Stennis uh, for the green run test. And uh, uh, they're, uh, you know, it's a it's a fairly good sized uh, good size engine when it's all said and done, and so the f the four engines put out about two million pounds of thrust, so they're each about a half a million each, um, but they run for eight and a half minutes, so they uh, they provide most of the impetus to get the vehicle into orbit. And um, this is actually down at Stennis, but again, it's kind of neat to see on the shop these things all. Loaded up and and ready to go, and uh, uh, they're actually made by Aerojet Rocketdyne in Canoga Park, uh, California facility, and uh, and um, there's like I say, there there was a you know, production line there for the shuttle. <clears throat> that production line continues for SLS, and uh, these motors were refurbished and taken off that line, and there actually are new motors being manufactured under contract now. Solid rocket boosters are the other interesting uh, uh, part, and the, and the bottom line is, is while the RS-25s have good levels of thrust, they don't have high levels of thrust, and so they don't really permit the vehicle, a heavy vehicle in particular, to get off the pad. And so, just like shuttle, and you've seen, you also see it on uh, on Delta IV and the Atlas as well, is that they'll use uh, solid rocket boosters as strap-ons for roughly about the first two minutes of flight to give extra energy to get the bird up and off the pad and to start moving. And um, so the uh, the solid rocket boosters are very similar to what was flown on shuttle, except that they've added a fifth segment. So it's roughly about 20% more powerful than the ones that flew on the shuttle. And, um, and basically, you know, it has a forward skirt, and a nose cap assembly on shuttle. There were recovery elements in that portion, but for SLS, we're not going to recover any of these, and so uh, and so uh, they're going to that that the recovery system is gone. Uh, they're going to in it. They're going to. They're just going to continue to let those drop in the ocean. And the real answer is 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 um, reuse was not the panacea that it was thought to be for this particular application. Um, uh, there's a lot of cost involved when you go have two ships that have to go out and recover the solid rocket boosters. Um, once they hit the salt water, um, it requires you to do a whole bunch of uh, inspections because these are man-rated systems. They're they're not for cargo. They're man-rated, so you have to take a lot of care. And when uh, and uh, in looking at making sure everything is taken care of on these boosters before you'll certify them as being uh, safe and, and ready to go for flight. And so, uh, uh, and the, the effects of corrosive salt water on these hot cases 
uh, a lot of times drove them out around, and so they have special rounding rings to to bring them back into place. And so the bottom line was is the cost to reuse was about equal to the cost uh, of buying a new one. The advantage was for the reuse, particularly on the man-rated program, is there was a huge database of how the motor performed, how it acted. You know, you could go in and inspect uh, uh, the nozzle surfaces, the insulation surfaces, the field joints, and have a really good idea of how everything performed. When you throw them away, you lose all that all that data. So, um, but these burn just a little bit over two minutes but they provide the big amount of thrust to help gets the vehicle uh, off the off the pad. And um, actually have seen two of these uh, five segment tests up at Promontory, Utah. And even though you're a mile away, when you see it in some respects, it's more interesting and more impressive than actually going to the, uh, to the Cape and seeing an actual uh, launch for the fact that this thing sits there two minutes and it cooks and it cooks and it cooks and it cooks and it doesn't fly away from you and you get a full feeling of, of what the power inside this really is. It will, the low level vibrations will rattle your pants and you can feel inside your ribs, your uh, your organs moving around a little bit as it, as it continues to uh, rock and roll. And like I say, it goes on and on and on and, and, uh, and uh, at the two minutes mark, when it starts to to uh, tail off, it's like it almost seems like time stopped. It's uh, it's very impressive. Recommend if you ever get the chance to go see one of those. They uh, before COVID, they were all open to the public, and you can go in a special viewing area. And uh, again, it's closer than where you can go to the viewing area if you actually see a launch down at the Cape. So it's a uh, it's pretty impressive. But uh, these are these are pretty fantastic uh, uh, birds when it's all said and done. And uh, this is one of the static tests um, in process right there. Um, um, these are manufactured by, uh, now it's Northrop Grumman. It was Orbital ATK, and before that it was ATK, and before that it was Thiokol. Um, these are the largest solid rocket motors uh, made. They're human rated on top of it, and uh, they're incredible incredible works of art in the picture here if you look you can kind of see sort of in the middle that's actually a support because these little puppies sag <laughs> they're so big and so heavy that it's a support to make sure it doesn't droop uh and when you walk underneath there you can see where where it wants to um they're just that big they're 12 feet in diameter and the booster is about 177 feet long so uh, like that and of course the most amazing thing is is uh, they weigh about 1.6 million pounds. 1.5 of it is propellant that all burns. So uh, you want to talk about reloads? These are these are huge reloads. Uh, very very impressive. One other thing on this picture that I'll talk about is so this goes out and then the cloud plume goes up against the hillside and it goes goes up and uh, um, people from Thiokol or ATK used to go out and pick up. Um, it would it would turn some of the sand into glass, and uh, they finally banned that because everybody was getting their hands cut so bad. It is so so hot um, that uh, you're trying to get your piece of piece of glassified sand out of it. You, you cut your hands, so they they uh, they quit that. Oh, this didn't come through with all the cute little things that I thought. So this is going to be the 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 booster obsolescence. Uh, um, uh, portion and uh, and they're going to replace the steel cases with carbon fiber and put a little bit more upgraded propellant into it uh, so that so that it uh, it will perform even better. So uh, at this point in time, it probably is cheaper to manufacture the carbon fiber epoxy um, uh, cases than it is to go back and do the do the steel, and so that's a cost savings. Uh, in this, we're going to put in the hydroxyl terminated polybutene propellant, similar to what's in your your Aerotech uh, motors. But the old shuttle motors actually used P-band, which was an older type, harder propellant. So uh, this actually gives a little bit more performance than what was into them. Uh, they've changed the grain configuration on the inside uh, to minimize the uh, the uh, aerodynamic forces or the max Q. 
on on the bird, and they can do that by changing the shape and the webs. And then they have uh, um, wound elastomeric insulation. So the insulation is uh, literally when they make this, they put the the insulation. It's a rubber Kevlar mix. They put that on the uh, steel mandrels first, and then wind the carbon fiber over it. So it's all one integrated uh, procedure or one procedure when they do it. Um, and then, uh, of course, for the shuttle, they don't need the core core ring. Um, the aft assembly is pretty much similar to what was done before. I don't have a picture here, but I still have the booster separation motors um, that push it away from the vehicle. And, uh, and that's uh, similar to what was flown all the time on shuttle. Um, and again, forward assembly, there's no parachute in it, so they re-optimized the uh, uh, the mass and uh, and also the attach location on that and uh, and revised the avionics going into it and uh, they have a different systems tunnel they have a new destruct charge and uh, they have a different attach scheme because the uh, shuttle attach scheme came before what they decided to do on on Titan four and uh, Northrop Grumman's Omega style which is also on Gem sixty three. And uh, so it's a, this is going to be a more powerful motor, and they actually have started to manufacture uh, the test motors for this up at Promontory. Not sure when the first uh, test firing of this one is going to be, um, but it should be impressive. And that will give an additional three to seven metric tons of payload to lower the, or to TLI. Um, then the exploration upper stage. This is the second stage. So the first one is called the, the interim cryogenic propulsion, and that uses one RL-10 engine. Um, eventually, they will go to the exploration upper stage, and that will put uh, four of those in the stack with bigger tanks and with uh, bigger things. But the one RL-10 gets them relatively uh, fast-tracked into orbit and uh, and uh, also, quite frankly, for some of the lower lower uh, uh, orbital masses that they need and, and like that it takes care of it and they don't need the the bigger uh, the bigger thing now the interesting thing about the rl10 is that it's been around uh you know since the 60s what's and it's manufactured by aerojet rocketdyne down in the facility in west palm beach florida so it doesn't it's not doesn't show up in the california plant it shows up in the florida plant that has been Rocketdyne, has been Pratt and Whitney Rocketdyne, and is now Aerojet uh, Rocketdyne. But what's interesting about that is, is, is the uh, the core engine is basically the same as it's always been, but uh, we've been able to go back in and take advantage of advanced techniques and and the ones that'll be on Artemis and the ones that we're getting ready to make uh, for uh, United Launch Alliance is. Uh, is uh, RL-10C, and that turns around and has quite a bit, a number of 3D printed parts in it that let us go uh, reduce a, a number of the manufacturing tasks and save a lot of time and a lot of money in it. So it's a, uh, it's a, uh, even though you know it's a, uh, uh, an older design, it's been upgraded to take advantage of common manufacturing techniques. And just like the RS-25, this is a high energy liquid hydrogen LOX uh, engine. It's restartable and uh, so it allows uh, for orbital insertion and that's part of the reason you can get away with a with a two-stage vehicle. So like I say, when they need more lift power, they're going to gain four of these up, have bigger tanks, and um, that will uh, that will give you the, the large amount of mass that you need to send to the moon. And here is the interim uh, cryogenic propulsion stage uh, for the first flight. And uh, um, the amazing thing on the liquids, and as model rocketeers, I think we're all used to the solids that are pretty simple. You kind of plug them in and go. Um, the plumbers on these things, the, the plumbing, I mean, it is unbelievable. Um, how complex this can be and you can just see that rat's nest of crap in the back end and it's like how does anybody keep track of that and the honest answer i'll tell you is i don't know um launch port system uh, again more propulsion on on things here it's uh it's kind of kind of interesting so the basic scheme is fairly similar to what we saw on the apollo series 
And down at the bottom, you'll see there's a fairing assembly that covers the, the, the Orion capsule. And that uh, gives it uh, structural protection as it goes through the early part of the atmosphere and, uh, and protects it. And so, uh, so that, uh, that helps quite a bit. So how this is actually designed for two different kind of uh, flight modes. So one would be the normal flight mode. And in that case, the only motor that fires is the jettison motor. Okay, so the jettison motor, uh, I'll show you in a little bit, but that one takes takes the cover and everything away. Um, and then the abort motor, okay, um, that one can pull the whole capsule away if it needs to, or it helps to move away the, uh, the uh, fairing assembly and everything as well. The attitude control motor, um, it helps keep it uh, state, and that's that's kind of a, a divert motor. That's actually uh, think of it more as a, a attitude control system than an actual propulsion. So we'll go through and look at a little bit of these in detail. So here's two of the motors. The one on the left is the jettison motor that hauls everything away, and the one on the right is the uh, is actually the abort motor. And this is a unique motor because the nozzles are at the head end and they literally are you know cranked around and, and turned back, but that whole cylinder is filled with propellant. And it's you can almost think of it as an upside down uh rocket motor. But uh you can see they're good sized and uh they move them around and assemble these on on uh, wheeled dollies that go on rails, and so everything is set up in such a way so it all can be mated together and uh and uh it makes uh, assembly fairly easy. They try and do as much as they can in a horizontal position. And then when they get that done, then they'll break it over and put it in a vertical. So, and on the launch abort motor, here's here's the whole assembly getting ready to get the rest of the fairing broken over in the vertical position. Um, and uh, Northrop Grumman makes the uh, main a a abort motor. They also make the attitude control motor that I'll show you. And um, so to do the static test for this, they turn it upside down, they put it in this big stand and then fire it. And you can see the four different flames on the right. Uh, it's a it's a pretty impressive uh, a deal and um, it doesn't burn very long. So it's a high high G high. Uh, um, I think about three seconds is all that it burns. And uh, it's a pretty impressive, uh, pretty impressive test to go see as well. This is the attitude control uh, motors. Now, these are solid propellant. But you got to think of them more as gas generators, and they have valves in the motors equally spaced. And so they fire this, and by closing and opening uh, the valves, they can they can steer the whole uh, uh, launch abort system or the launch abort system with the crew. And so there are there are high temperature uh, alloys inside that are the valves that literally can open and close. And that gives you, you know, the steering capability that that you need. Um, the beauty of being a solid system, it doesn't leak, it doesn't drip. They don't have to worry about it. It's very um, uh, tolerant of uh, the environment it's set it in. And, you know, basically it's done. You don't have to do anything to the rocket on the pad. So, but that's a pretty impressive test to see as well. And then this is the jettison motor, which is, which is a, uh, which is made by Aerojet, um, and again, you can see it has four canted nozzles, and again, that's a little unusual, but uh, but uh, it diverts. So there's one propellant grain, and you can think of it as similar to what the Aer uh, Aerotech Medusa nozzles are like, and that drives that away. And so, uh, so like I say, it's the only ones that's activated in all the mission scenarios. Uh, so needless to say. Uh, um, all our eyes are on this when this thing fires, and uh, it's a good-sized little motor as well. Then uh, on the service module, there's a European um, uh, provided by Airbus on the, on the service module, which is similar again to what to what Apollo used, and uh, um, so that comes in and it sits behind the Orion capsule, and it provides not only propulsion but it's got the power and uh, energy and uh, and uh, air and water in that module to supplement what's in the capsule and um, so that'll be that'll be flown and then that's planned for a crew flight as well and um, 
like there's three propulsion systems on that as well. It has some uh, reaction control systems, thrusters for attitude control, um, and eight auxiliary engines that can move it side to side. And, uh, and then it has a big uh, OMSE uh, uh, engine uh, as well for large transitional birds. So lots of rocket motors on this thing when it's all said and done. And again, to give you an idea how big SLS is, I pulled these two uh, graphics off to give you an idea. Uh, over on the right, everybody talks about, well, why can't you do this with Falcon 9? Well, you can see Falcon 9, even the heavy configuration is nowhere near the size and has nowhere near the lift capability of what SLS is. So, so you know, when you see this picture, I think you understand that SLS is, is a huge rocket. And on the main graph, you can see it's much bigger um, than uh, than even a Saturn V, and um, so uh, it's a uh, it's it's a good size. It's going to be much bigger than New Glenn, and you know currently, the, really the one of the largest one is flying is a Delta IV Heavy, and you can see how significantly bigger it is uh, than that, along with uh, the Vulcan or what the space shuttle was. So, so it's a it's a good size. Uh, Good size rocket when it's all said and done, and um, because this is uh, rockets, I needed to translate this in terms of uh, in terms of NER speak. <laughs> and so, if you were going to go down to your local hobby shop and buy an RS twenty five, you'd be asking for an EE class motor, uh, one point eight million. I, I assume all these are plugged, although the original RSRMs. But the real one that you'd want for, you know, most of the stuff that we would fly would be the five segment RSRM, which is also an EE class motor, and it's roughly a, a 10 million. So I'd like to go in and order uh, two EE 10 million dash P's for my project. And uh, speaking of complex stages, so if you're going to go out, I'm assuming this is probably level five certification if you're doing this kind of stuff. I've always claimed that. I'm level five certified because my fingerprints are on stuff, rocket motors and stuff that are in orbit. Um, but if this whole thing is an actual an HH class of roughly 12 million, an HH 12 million motor. So it has got a lot. The, the, the interesting thing about doing this work up with, uh, with these sizes is, you know, as the size doubles, um, there's big windows when you start to get up past Z. <laughs> and uh, just to show you that the, the stage two uh, ICPS is a Z 110,000 motors. Uh, but if you if you put four of them together, you go into the CC class. So uh, very impressive. Uh, the launch abort motor is a V motor. OK. And the jettison motor is an R motor. So. Now, that gets interesting because, you know, there are people out there who have flown motors now starting to get close to that class. So, yeah, you know, theoretically, you could have one of those, you know, at home. So that's kind of where I'm leaving it. Let's see if I can get over and start to see where questions are. So. Okay, well, let's see where we'll... it's being slow on me, so hang on here. There we go. Okay. Uh, trade offs on the canted nozzle from Joyce Guzik. Yes, Joyce, there, there absolutely is a trade off. You, you basically lose part of the vector you would get if you would go straight down. But you're looking at a, a structural type application. We don't want to add that, add the weight uh, that it would go to protect everything from the 5,000 degree flame uh, temperatures. So we generally don't. Uh, we, we live with the the thrust loss on the uh, on the uh, on the cant, and uh, and uh, the answer, of course, is to put more propellant in, which is always a good thing. So. Um, Tom Dish asks, what cost the early motor shut down on the last full up test? Haven't seen the final analysis yet. They're still looking at it. But um, 
it appears to be so when you're running these tests and keep in mind you know the green run um, stage is the stage that they're going to take out of that stand transport it down to the cape and put it on the pad so you know it is it is flight hardware it's not something that you dare break <laughs> in any way shape or form and my understanding is is they had set a couple of the trigger parameters on the performance and i'm not sure which parameters they were referring to but they had what they called pretty conservative limits on it and it was like we don't know if that's going to break things but we don't want to see it go above that and they tripped some of that so at least one of those parameters that caused the shutdown about four minutes into the test there was no real indication that anything was wrong and I saw yesterday that um, that they've decided they're going to do another green run down there, so they're gonna they're gonna run it again. So they they don't think they broke anything. The complication behind all doing that is that the tank and some of the components are really only good for about eight to nine propellant loadings. Just the the impact of loading the liquid hydrogen and the liquid oxygen into those structures past a certain point. Um, they just don't that you're worried about cracking and other things going on and so there's a limit and uh, so when they do this test again they're going to take one of their tank and detank uh, opportunities or options out of the mix should they go to the cape and have bad weather or run into technical gremlins down there um so so that's uh you know that's that's the one of the concerns but uh they said they're they're going to they're going to do that so it'll be interesting to see so gary asked me about on the srbs you mentioned they are constrained for max q can i explain what they do well there's there's two things so first of all max q is the, the maximum pressure that that you fly through and it puts the maximum load on the vehicle and the maximum amount of things shaking and these these are incredibly violent machines i mean you know, you have nothing on an airplane compared to what these things go. And and I'll illustrate a, a little bit more is that the, the liquids tend to be pretty benign and they're not violent when they when they fire. Uh, the solids are like riding a train wreck, according to Ron Graby, uh, who uh, who I worked for. And he rode two flights on the shuttle uh, before Challenger and two flights afterwards. And the two flights afterwards, they wore their helmets. They weren't wearing the helmets on the two before. And he said, he said, when the solids kick in, he goes, it's just like riding a train wreck for for um, two minutes. They bang and bang and bang and bang and bang. And he said, the difference was, is when he got in the helmet, you know, he could still feel the vibrations, but they heard none of the noise because they were, you know, not in the situation. So when you're designing the launch vehicle, you want to minimize those aerodynamic load forces. And so what they've done with the solids is they've tailored the grain in such a way that they literally have reduced the burning surface area when they get to that point. So they literally, and, and what they've done is changed the bore and the fins. They've designed it in such a way so that it literally down throttles at a certain point and then it can go back up when it gets past that point and that's all load relief in order to minimize the amount of loads that go on the entire vehicle and the entire structure obviously if you exceed that you're going to break stuff never a good day and if you uh you know so so by being able to to do that and they and they literally do that by changing the mandrel um, you can also do it on some of the, some of the different systems they do it by changing the uh, propellant uh, but this one they changed they changed the size of the mandrel and the, and they they changed the the shape of the fins and the forward end in order to in order to kind of throttle it down effectively ah harder propellant on srbs robert asked so in the old so p band uh propellants are basically epoxy based and you would get the equivalent of what um what was in all the space shuttle motors if you mixed your Bob Smith five minute epoxy with table salt. And if you probably press on that, it, you know, it's, it's pretty hard and, uh, and like that. When you switch to HTPB and if you've ever played with the reload kit, so the HTPB is actually a better rubber and it moves and the greens actually move. And that actually gives you a lot more flexibility to, to a point of things you can do it moves with temperature better and so it's not likely to crack if it gets cold and 
when you hit it initially with a pressurization wave, you don't crack it open. So, so the HTPB propellant is softer and gives, and it's closer in consistency to like what a rubber pencil eraser is like. So, so that's kind of the difference between the two, two propellants. So let's see. Chaz Russell is asking, have the new RS-25 engine controllers changed the ignition sequence compared to that used in the shuttle? Um, I don't know. You've asked me one and, st and stumped me there. I actually believe they have a little bit because I think they're pretty soft to make sure they don't build uh, additional acoustic loads up with the four engines in the cluster instead of the three. But exactly what they've done, I don't think I can, can answer that. Uh, and Dan Bates asked, uh, what's the next motors, uh, motors test for SLS? When? I, I'm not sure when, um, <laughs> and schedules on SLS have been subject to change anyhow. I think they're going to do the, the green run test, I think I, sometime after Valentine's Day, that week after, but I think it's, uh, it's fairly fluid at this, at this point in time. So, and I think... Let's see, let me go some more. So Bob Sanford asked, are there plans to replace the RL10 engines with like engines like the J2X? Bob, at this point in time, um, I have not heard, you know, Aerojet did a lot, or Rocketdyne did a lot of work on uh, J2X years ago, and uh, I've not heard. So developing a liquid rocket engine turns out to be incredibly expensive again like solid rocket motors and like you know when gary rosenfield he says he tests you know 10 to 30 for his qualification because solids you basically put them in the stand light them up and see how they go these liquid guys uh you know they first they got to test for a tenth of a section they got to go do burp tests and they got to do them at all different pressures and then they come back and then they run them for a second and then they come back and then they run them for five seconds and then they creep up on it and run for 10 seconds. And all these different modes can also introduce uh, combustion instability and they may change the ratios and everything. So there's like a hundred billion things to test on the liquids, whereas the, the solids are light them and go. So as a result, developing a new engine like the J2X is very, very expensive and you've got to really understand what you've got. My understanding is, is, is they're, they're, going to probably keep the J2X on the shelf and continue running the, the RL10 since they're already so so well uh, characterized and they understand what they're getting. And because of the cost reductions that have been made, it's probably not cost effective to go do uh, additional, additional uh, development. So uh, Paul, asked, Paul Kinzer asked, are there significant differences between the booster segment seals between the four segment ones and the one ones used on SLS. So on the current ones that are going to fly in the first eight missions or whatever, no, there's not really any difference. Those all represent the improved um, uh, post-challenger uh, joints uh, with, with the improvements that, they, that they've tested. There, there are some tweaks, but nothing, nothing big. When they, uh, when they go to the carbon fiber cases, though, they're going to make some additional um adjustments and improvements part of it is is the the steel is pretty rigid and when it pressurizes it doesn't move much the carbon fiber is a little bit more of a balloon and it moves and it makes the joints rotate a little bit differently and so they're designing to take that into effect and make sure that the joints don't rotate out and separate so there'll be some changes when they switch when they switch to the uh to the bowl motor uh but nothing significant and nothing much different. They're they're pretty happy with the the segment seals now that they they've got and they've pretty much uh, uh, tested them. So Dwayne asked, uh, will the new style SRBs be introduced in the Block One B or the Block Two? Those actually will be the gate that they'll go into the Block Two, and it li literally is is when they run out of the other ones they'll they'll switch. So that Block Two will be with the the new bowl uh, RSRM motors on it. Um, Leo asked about in the shuttle program, the solid boosters had O-ring issues. Have those been resolved for Artemis program? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's been uh, well over 100 flights of, uh, of the redesigned uh, motor uh, without any issues. And uh, um, that problem uh, was not well understood prior to Challenger, but a lot of time and a lot of effort, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears 
have been uh, expended over that, and uh, I think those problems are solved, and certainly everybody's uh, sensitivity to those issues is is erased. Uh, uh, Thiokol managed to keep Alan McDonald on uh, as a consultant. I got to work with him in the past, and I think, think Alan is still involved in some of this kind of as the oversight, and he was the guy who raised the flag in the first place. And so, so uh, it, I'd say, you know, those issues are behind, but, you know, it's a – you know, these things are some of the most complex machines ever built. And like I say, they're high energy, high vibration, extreme environments machines. Um, they're not easy. And uh, and there's a lot of things that got to be watched on them in order to in order to get them fly, let alone, God forbid, you know, put people on them. So there's a lot of engineering challenges that they watch. The O-rings are behind them, I think, and are pretty well understood. But you know, they're trying to be very diligent about making sure there are no other issues hiding in the weeds. So um, Bowden asked, "Is what part of the rocket touches down on the moon? And so I've not touched on any of the things that there's there's a separate lunar lander that's that's that that's encapsulated in SLS for those missions. I didn't talk about that at all because that's a downstream uh, part that's being developed separately. So. Um, yeah, I'll be able to do that. Uh, let's see. My good friend Zoran is uh, listening in from Europe, and he says, uh, for scale models, will there be any outline drawings available? And the answer is yes. Um, I'm busy accumulating <laughs> um, a, a number of them for a, for a, a couple of different projects. And uh, so uh, I think that we'll be able to uh, to be able to uh, to get good drawings of this uh um, more interesting probably will be being able to get good uh, good photographs. Um, uh, so why can't the abort motors do double double duty as the jettison? Um, the uh, the uh, abort motors are designed to take the whole mass of the capsule off, as opposed to the jettison, which just needs to take the uh, take the uh, um, tower away, and so. You know that's the that's the easy reason why you would use two, and it's cheaper and easier to go do that in terms of weight. So let's see, and I got I think time for one more. Um, this, this is all very complicated and expensive. Yes, it is. How could a private company do something of this magnitude on their own dime? Um, it's complicated and expensive, but given enough money and enough brilliant people. You you can do it. It'll be interesting to see. I mean, you know, he, Elon Musk is a genius. He's changed two industries. He's very visionary. Um, you know, we'll we'll see whether he does or how he does it. But uh, certainly, uh, you know, 15 years ago, nobody gave him a, a, a big chance of being able to do what he's done so far. And he continues to push the envelope and do a lot of interesting things. So. Uh, um, whether or not he's successful is probably immaterial. He's driven, he's driven things to where we're actively thinking about going to Mars and developed, I think, a, a national and an international will to see that is a is a positive thing. So, and I think I'll end with one more. Guys asked me, uh, uh, when it gets to the point of NASA setting a launch date, do you think it it will be hard? Data or a window. It typically will be a a, a a window, given the way that the weather works in in K, at the Cape. And so, uh, um, yeah, if you go down, first of all, a new launch vehicle rarely launches on the first launch attempt. There's just a lot of gremlins in the damn thing to to work out. So, uh, you know, if you go down, you should book, you know, airplane flights five or six days after the first date. You need to have a hotel reserved. And and I trust me. The minute it's announced, go get your hotel reservation because it's uh, it'll book up quick and you'll be driving from Tampa uh, to go. One last question before I go: Is it too late to add fins to the rear vehicle? <laughs> it's like no. These guys seem to to uh, to be stuck on thrust vector control and we're slowly losing our fins. I, I tried like heck. I was working at at Orbital Sciences when we did the abort ascent vehicle. And my boss was all very versed on Little Joe 1 and Little Joe 2. And I tried like hell to get fins on that, and I couldn't get it. So the problem is, is we can move the nozzles, and the guidance systems are good enough that fins have kind of gone away. So uh, 
So with that, I think I will uh, I will uh, thank everybody for listening and uh, feel free to email me through the North Coast site if you got other questions. Thanks everybody.